up, Rock City? What's up, Rock City? All right, all right. Uh, you, you, can, you can be seated. <laughs> you can be seated. Thank you. Well, welcome, Hilliard, Polaris, Short North, online. If you're joining us from a correctional facility, just welcome. We're so glad to have each and every one of you here. Um, you guys, I love worshiping with you all each and every week. Um, it's one of my favorite things in the world to do, but this is special for me. This is just a special opportunity uh, for me to speak to you all, and so I'm very grateful. I'm very humbled. Uh, so special thank you to Pastor Chad and Katie for giving me this opportunity. Um, let's give it up for Pastor Chad and Katie. You guys, we have some incredible leaders in this church, and it starts with those two right there. Um, as Pastor Chad stated, I'm on staff here in our worship department, and as a part of my job focus, there's a particular focus on building the Polaris worship team, but there's also a focus generally with all of our 90-plus volunteers, and the bulk of that focus is the spiritual development of our worship team, because we want to become better singers, and we want to become better musicians, but more than that, we want to become better followers of Jesus, better disciples, right? And so as a part of that focus, actually a lot of what we're going to be talking about today, we've been talking about as a team, and we've been learning, and we've been growing in. So hopefully two things will happen by the end of the day. One is we'll all hear what God has to say about worship, and that is the most important thing. But also as an added bonus, I'm hoping that you all will learn a little bit about the teams that lead you into worship each and every week. You're, you're going to get a sneak peek behind the curtain of what we talk about, where our hearts are, our focus, our perspective, our goals when it comes to worship. Is that all right? All right, let's, uh, let's pray and then, and then we'll dive right in. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence in this place, Lord God. We ask that you just speak by your spirit and through your word. Fill me with your spirit that I would speak only what is in line with your word. And if I say anything out of line, Lord God, I pray that you protect the ears of the people listening. We only want to hear from you, Lord God. Give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. I have been working at Rock City for a little bit over a year. And every now and again, I'll meet someone new and we'll engage in the obligatory small talk. Right, hi, how are you doing? What's your name? I like your shoes, I like your shirt. And eventually we get to the question, what do you do? Now, I used to really love the question, what do you do? Because before I worked here, for seven years I was a forensic scientist for the state of Ohio. I know, right? It, it, it sounds cool, so when someone asked, what do you do? And I got to say, oh, you know, forensic scientist. They're like, oh, that sounds impressive. I'm like, it is, right? It's so cool, right? Uh, whatever. Um, and, and then they'd ask me a bunch of questions, and two questions that always came up. The first one was, is that like CSI? <laughs> it's not like TV, but I just let them, yeah, close enough, right? And then the other question was, do you get to wear a lab coat? I, I have no idea. I don't know why. As soon as someone found out I was a forensic scientist, very high on their list of priorities, was getting down to the bottom of the mystery of, do you wear a lab coat? Now, the answer is yes, and I wanted to prove it to you, so I went back in the archives. I wanted to find a picture of me at work in a lab coat, but I couldn't find one. Uh, it, it, I know. Uh, it, 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 <laughs> it, it turns out that, that taking selfies in a lab full of forensic evidence is kind of frowned upon. <laughs> so so I, I did what I think is the next best thing. <laughs> so this, this, this is a... This is a mediocre Photoshop of my face on a random scientist that I found on Google. So if you squint your eyes a little bit, just squint them, that's pretty, that was my life. That's what I looked like before I was working here at Rock City. So I, I used to love the question, what do you do? Obviously, I mean, who wouldn't, right? I get to wear a lab coat. But also there was at least a general baseline understanding when I told them what I did, even if that understanding was CSI in a lab coat, got it. But now when I get that question, I get some different responses to my answer. Sometimes people respond when I say I'm a worship pastor or a worship leader at a church, and they go, uh, they understand. And they're like, oh, cool, what church? I say, Rock City Church. And they're like, oh, cool, I go to such and such church. And it's a smooth conversation, and it's, and it's great. Sometimes they respond and they say, is that like a minister or a priest? I'm like, mm, no, not, not, not a priest, like, like, like worship. So I like get up and I sing and I lead people in music and uh, like musical, you know, uh, you know what? Fine, yeah, I'm a priest. <laughs> I'm a priest. You know, and then sometimes I'm just met with blank stares and they want to change the subject as quickly as they can because they don't want nothing to do with worship or pastor or priest or church or anything. And I get a lot of these different responses. One, because people have their own experience, their own traditions, their own conceptions of what church is. But two, there's also, there's a vagueness that accompanies the term worship that doesn't accompany terms like doctor, teacher, bus driver. 
Some people hear worship and they think of singing. Some people hear worship and they think of a shrine with images and incense and bowing down. And some people hear worship and they just think general unhinged fanaticism. If you're just, if you're a blank worshiper, no matter what it is, it's just like, oh, so, so you're crazy. You're weird. You, you don't think you just passionately, blindly follow whatever it is that you so-called worship. Some of you today wondering, what did we just do? What, what was the music? It's loud and the people are singing. Like, what was that? So I think it's important that if we're going to talk about worship, that we all get on the same page about what we mean when we say it. So worship most generally can be understood as ascribing ultimate worth. Ascribing ultimate worth. Because we all value a number of different things, but we value those things differently. Like, I value my shoes, which is why, depending on the pair that I'm wearing, if it's raining outside, you'll probably catch me walking around with a couple of plastic bags tied around my ankles because I don't want them to get wet. I value my shoes. But I don't value them as much as my car or my house or my friends. And I value all of those things, but not as much as I value my family, my wife and my two twin girls that hopefully, Lord willing, will be born in December. It's my beautiful wife, Stephanie. Our, our two baby girls who I'm sure are adorable. The picture's not great, but, but they're adorable. Trust me. They're so cute. They're so cute. And I, and I love my family, but not as much as I value and love my creator, my savior. See, there are things that I value more than other things. There's a hierarchy. And as with any hierarchy, eventually you get to the top. There's that thing that you value more than anything else. And that is what you worship. And if we understand worship this way, it doesn't take long before we realize that everybody worships something. Everybody worships something. Everybody has something that's on the top of their hierarchy. That means that worship is not a religious thing, really. It's a human thing. We were created to worship. We can't not. We are worshipers by design. We have all been created with a throne that sits on top of our hearts. And that throne is never, can never, will never be empty. Now, initially, we were created to glorify God and enjoy him forever. We were made in the image of God so that we could reflect his glory in every way and at all times. Isaiah 43, verse 7 says, this is the Lord speaking, this is God. He says, everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. We were created for the glory of God. And, and even when sin corrupted God's good creation, it didn't remove our impulse to worship. It simply redirected it. So now instead of worshiping God, I worship anything else. Romans 1.25 shows us that in our sin, we exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. We're wired to worship. We got to worship something. It's either God or it's an idol. And not only do we all worship something, but whatever it is that we worship, whatever we value the most, it will be on display one way or another. And we do it with more than just our words. Right? Whatever we value the most, we're willing to make sacrifices for We'll take risks for that thing. We'll abandon the comfort and safety for that thing. Our lives revolve around whatever it is. A man who works 80 to 90 hours a week and neglects his family is saying that he values his job probably more than he values his family, even if he would never admit it with his words. A young boy or young girl who spends more time in the mirror than they spend in the word of God and in prayer is saying that they value their outward appearance probably more than they value the health of their soul and their relationship with God, whether or not they would ever admit it. See, the fact of the matter is, whatever we worship, that's what we serve. And it shapes our mind, it shapes our hearts, it shapes our very lives. And Jesus knew this very well when he said that the greatest commandment was to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength. He's saying that above all, we are to worship God with everything that we are. More than just a few songs, more than with just our words, true Christian worship is to give all of yourself fully to God and to the praise of his glory so that your life declares to the world that whatever else it may be, Jesus is more valuable. It can be summarized like this, and this is in your notes. There's no fill-ins, but I want you to read it in your notes. It says, Christian worship is our right response to the revelation of God in which we, through Christ and by the power of his spirit, align our words, our actions, and our hearts behind the singular purpose of bringing God glory. Now, I know that's a lot. I know it's dense, it's, it's packed in, which is why it's in your notes, because I want to encourage you to take it home and read it and reread it and reread it and just dig into it and take it apart and meditate on it. But basically, God reveals himself to us, otherwise we would never know that he even exists. 
He reveals himself and his Holy Spirit works in our hearts so that I can see his glory and also that I would love what I see. And then he continues to empower me to align all that I am behind the purpose of magnifying and bringing even more glory to God with my life. That's what Christian worship is. So why then do we sing? It's a good question. Why, why, why do we use music? Why do we use instruments? Why do we sing? Well, the first reason is because we are commanded to. We're commanded to by God in his word. Psalm 150 says, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his acts of power. Praise him for his surpassing greatness. Praise him with the sounding of the trumpet. Praise him with the harp and lyre. Praise him with cymbal and dancing. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with the clash of cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals that everything that has breath, <gasps> praise the Lord. One more praise the Lord for good measure at the end, right? That's six verses, 13 times we are commanded to praise him. And maybe that ratio is not convincing enough for you. So let's go to Psalm 47, verse 6, where it says, Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our king, sing praises. That's one verse, four commands to sing praises to God. Notice it didn't say sing well. <laughs> praise God. I don't know who needs to hear this, but skill is not a prerequisite to praise. <laughs> Squawk all you want in this house. Just praise him, sing praises. And there are many more calls like that in the scripture to praise God through song. And if it's repeated that many times, it's got to be important. If God commands it, I can be sure that it is for his glory and for my good somehow, some way. And that's all I'm going to say on that. Right? God said it. We do it. And that should be enough. Right. We could all go home right now. But don't don't get up. Don't, don't get up. I, I have just a few more minutes and I intend to use them. All right. The other reason why we sing is because singing helps us. Remember. That's it. Singing helps us remember. Colossians 3, verse 16, let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. Singing can help the Word of God to dwell in us richly. It can take it from something that we know in our head and bury it deep within our hearts. This is one of the peculiar powers of melody. It helps us remember whatever it is that we sing. This is why we probably can't remember all 50 state capitals or any of the elements from the periodic table, but you can remember every word to a song that you haven't heard since the fifth grade. Melody is powerful. Here, let's do a little experiment. All right, I need y'all to lean in and help me out a little bit. I said I'm a scientist, right? Let's do an experiment. Let's do an experiment. If I were to say, in West Philadelphia, born and raised, on the playground is where I spend most of my days, chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cooling off. When a couple of guys who were up to no good, I got in one little fight and my mom got scared and said, y'all, that show aired 30 years ago. The last episode aired 1996. That's 25 years ago. I Googled it to make sure because I'm like, that ain't right. 25 years, 25 years. Y'all know every word. <laughs> Singing is powerful. And, and it's useful for remembering not just the theme song to one of the top three sitcoms of all time. <laughs> and that's a fact. But it can, it can help us remember the word of God. See, we, we, we memorize the Bible, first of all. Memorize as much as you can. It's one of the best things that you could ever do, but sometimes you just can't remember that verse that you're trying to recall. You may not remember Colossians 1, 16 through 17, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, rulers, and authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. You might not remember that off the top of your head, but you might remember, no battle will ever raise beyond you. The victory belongs to the God who holds all things. But you, you might just remember that. Singing helps us remember what we sing, which is why it's important to remember that when it comes to worship, truth is king. Truth is king always. It doesn't matter how good the song is musically. Truth is king. Jesus tells us in John chapter 4 that we're to worship God in spirit and in truth. 
That is the truth of who God really is based on what he says about himself in the Bible, not whatever I imagine him to be like. And if you're unsure about the truth of a song that we sing, even in this house, please, I'm, I'm asking you, please don't sing it. Go home, open your Bible, search the scriptures. If the song is in there, come back next week and sing it with us. Right? Make sure that the worship songs that you listen to agree with the entirety of God's word, not just a verse or two taken out of context. We have to be diligent students of the word of God if we're to be great worshipers of God. Because look, knowing the Bible, that's, that's the only way that I know what exactly it is that will bring God more glory. Knowing the Bible is how I can be sure that the way that I live and the songs that I sing, that I'm not inadvertently worshiping an idol of my own creation. When I think of who God is, I need to search the scriptures to see what he says about himself. Truth is king, always. Truth is king, but it's not the only thing that matters. If it were, we just read the lyrics from our favorite song. Or better yet, we just read through the scriptures. We'd gather, we'd just read straight down through the scriptures for 40 minutes and we'd all go home. There'd be no teaching, no exposition, no rhetorical sophistication, no melodic arrangements, nothing. But worship is not only about truth. It's about our heart's response to that truth. And we respond with our lives and with our actions, but there's also an appropriate emotional response to the truth of God. And music helps to facilitate and to amplify that appropriate emotional response. See, we sing because music engages the heart. Music engages our hearts in worship. Look, you can cry at a car commercial if the music is right. <laughs> right? It, it, it's powerful. This is another reason why we have to understand that the truth is king, because our emotions are powerful, but they're indiscriminate. They can attach themselves to anything. So we have to be diligent to attach them and give them an anchor that they can attach to. And if that anchor is anything but the word of God, we're going to have some serious problems. <laughs> we have to anchor our feelings, our emotions should be stirred not by the music alone, but by the glory of God. Music simply facilitates and helps the process along. Music does not and should not be used to create the emotion out of thin air, but to anchor our hearts in the truth of God and encourage our heart's response to that. Our emotions can be very dangerous if we attach them to a lie or we allow them to lead us. But our emotions are still good. They've been given to us by God. They're good if, big if, they're submitted to Christ and are used for his purposes. Because look, Christ came to redeem all of who we are. My thoughts, my actions, my words, my desires, my emotions. And I can use my emotions to bring God more glory. I can use them to bury his truth deep within my heart and fan into flame my desire to worship him and serve him and preach the gospel and proclaim his greatness. Our emotions can bring God glory. If only we would bring our emotions to God. Romans 12 verse 11 says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Keep your spiritual fervor. Keep your passion for serving the Lord. Our emotions are good when submitted to Christ, but we have to engage them properly. They have to have their proper place. And there's two extremes that we need to be careful about when it comes to our emotions. And trust me, I've been in environments where both of these extremes have been on full display. I grew up, uh, the, the, the bulk of my formative years in church were in the charismatic church where our emotions could get, we'll call it intense. <laughs> they could get intense, right? And, and we wanted them to. Look, I've been in worship experiences where if at the end I wasn't dehydrated from crying so much or I didn't pull a hamstring from running and jumping around, then worship was just all right. I'm like, it's all right. It was okay. We'll get him next time. And whether or not I was changed by Monday was kind of a secondary concern. But I've also been in environments where emotions were met with skepticism. Like, you, you better not let a smile creep across your face. And, and, and if you even think about raising your hand, we're calling security because this, that's not what we do here. Right? There's two extremes, and I've seen the whole spectrum, and we have to understand that there's danger in both extremes. And the first is emotionalism. Emotionalism, where I worship as if my feelings are what matter most. My feelings are what matter most. 
If I feel like singing, maybe I will. If I don't feel like it, if I don't like the song or I'm not in the mood, I'm not going to sing. An emotionalist allows their feelings to dictate whether or not they will worship. They make emotions the foundation of their worship. The emotionalist has emotions as the foundation of their worship. But we know that we we can't worship based upon how we feel. We worship based upon who God is, and he is always the same, and he's always worthy of our praise and our worship in our lives. Look, emotions make a terrible, 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 no good foundation. They're horrible. Emotions are fickle. They're always changing. But God and his word are unchanging. Hebrews 13, 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. My emotions are unstable, but God's word is stable. Isaiah 40, verse 8, the grass withers and the flower may fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. My emotions are untrustworthy. They can lie to me and mislead me, but the word of God is truth. John 17, 17, Jesus says, Father, sanctify them in your truth. Your word is truth. Your word is my foundation. An emotionalist makes how I feel the foundation. Can also make my emotions the goal of my worship. The goal of my worship. If I'm an emotionalist, I just want to feel something. And I don't care what prompts those feelings. I don't care what purpose those feelings serves. If, if, if my emotions are stirred by the glory of God or they're stirred by a sick guitar solo, I don't really care. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. I just want to run around and jump and clap my hands and cry, and I don't care how I get there. Emotions are the goal of my worship. But if you remember anything today, remember this. The word of God is our foundation, and the glory of God is our aim. The word of God is our foundation, and the glory of God is our aim. And and if our emotions become unanchored from the stable foundation of God's word, if we lose sight that the glory of God is the ultimate end and goal in all things, then our worship will have no substance, no depth, no direction, and will likely drift into idolatry that will leave us empty, addicted to simple experiences of musical catharsis, chasing emotional high after emotional high, and wondering why we're never filled. It's because your emotions can fuel you for a moment, but they can never fill you. They'll never satisfy. That's not what they're meant to do. Only Jesus can fully satisfy. Only he is a stable foundation and only he is a worthy aim. The word of God is my foundation and the glory of God is my aim in my worship and in my life. And if we're not careful, we can become emotionalists. And I want to encourage you to be a worshiper of God, not an emotionalist, a worshiper. And if we're not careful, we can become emotionalists. But there's also a danger in the other extreme, and that's an emotionless worshiper. An emotionless worshiper says, my feelings don't matter at all. They don't matter at all. Many of us have come to believe that it doesn't matter what we feel as Christians. As long as we do the right thing, as long as we just put our head down and do our duty, whether or not my heart is engaged, it doesn't matter. But consider this. If I said, I'm a Christian. I go to church every Sunday, I tithe, I do my devotions every morning, 15, 20, maybe even 30 minutes in the morning, but every day I can walk outside of my house and come face to face with intense suffering of the world around me. I see neglect and abuse and abandonment and homelessness and brokenness and sickness, and I feel no compassion at all for these people. You would look at me and say, what is wrong with you? What is wrong with you? You're a Christian, but you feel no compassion. Now, what if I said I'm a Christian And I can come to the gathering in the midst of God's people when the glories and the excellencies of God are being proclaimed and being celebrated and being sung about and being preached about. And I feel nothing. I feel no awe. I feel no joy. I feel no gratitude. What is wrong with me? It makes no sense. A Christian who feels nothing in the midst of God's praise makes as much sense as a Christian who feels no compassion in the face of suffering. Our emotions matter. The one thing I know about heaven is that we will still have our emotions and they will be fully awakened. There will be no more indifference. There will be no more boredom. We're not going to be in the presence of God checking our watches. (laughs) But, But what about now? What about in the meantime? It's hard to respond as we should to the truth of God. What if I am indifferent? What if I'm suffering? What if I'm grieving? What do I do with that? 
You bring it to God. You're honest with him. You don't fake it. God would know anyway. But we strive to say like the psalmist repeats through Psalm 42. Now, in Psalm 42, the psalmist was in intense oppression, depression, intense suffering and pain, and he expressed those feelings to God. But two times in verse 5 and verse 11, he says to himself, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him. Look, suffering is real. Grief and depression, they are real, but God is also real. And he's big enough to handle it all. So bring those things to him and then set your feet, set your eyes, set your hope in Christ. And if I can let you in on a little secret, sometimes you just need to speak to your own soul and say, hope in God for I shall yet praise him because sometimes our deepest worship comes in our darkest moments. Sometimes you just need to preach to yourself and worship anyway in your darkest moments. Pastor John Piper puts it beautifully when he says, my feelings are not God. God is God. My feelings do not define truth. God's word defines truth. My feelings are echoes and responses to what my mind perceives. And sometimes, many times, my feelings are out of sync with the truth. And when that happens, and it happens every day in some measure, I try not to bend the truth to justify my imperfect feelings, but rather I plead with God, purify my perceptions of your truth and transform my feelings so that they're in sync with the truth. If I don't feel like worshiping, I ask the Holy Spirit, please stir my heart so that I desire to worship you. And then in the meantime, I worship him anyway. Because God's glory is more important than my changing moods and circumstances, and my faith in God is more important than my feelings in the moment. It's it's more important. And so is the faith of those around me, which leads us to the question, why do we gather together and sing? Why do we sing in the gathering? Why did we all come here and sing these songs and and there's 15, 20 minutes of, of worship and music? Why do we do that when we come together? What's the point? What's what's important about that? Well, church, I don't know if anyone has ever told you this directly before, but when we gather to worship, your participation is the point. Your praise, your engagement, your contribution is the point. That's why we get up here. That's why we have lyrics on the the, the screen. It's not just so that you can watch and listen and consume as if this is some form of entertainment, but we want you to contribute and join with us as we lift the name of Jesus in this place. If I can be honest about the heart of our worship team, the heart of your worship team, really, none of us are here to entertain or impress you. We could not care less if you're impressed with us. We don't care. right? We're just up here because we want to point people to Jesus. We want to link arms with you, stand beside you, and worship him in unity together. Look, a win for us is not hearing that we're great. We don't care. We just want to see you worship a great God, and we want to step in there with you and worship him together. God can do amazing things when his people gather and worship together. And one of the things that he can do is he can produce faith in the heart of the unbeliever. Through our worship, God can produce faith in the heart of the unbeliever. Look, our mission at Rock City is to make heaven full. And and I know, I can tell from the service opportunities that we do and the community service and the monies that go towards preaching the gospel and planning churches and, and all the things that this church does, I really believe that everyone in this church believes that their time, their talent, and their treasures are working towards making heaven full. But there is another way that you individually, personally, can help make heaven full. And that is by engaging and participating in corporate worship. It matters a lot. Look, in Psalm 40, 1 through 3, it says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry, lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Now watch this. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God, and many will see and fear the Lord and put their trust in him. God doesn't save us and establish our feet on the solid rock so that we could keep that as a secret and carry it to our grave. We're not called to receive this salvation and keep quiet about it. That's just not what we're called to do. We're not called to receive this light and hide it under a basket as Jesus warns about in Matthew 5. Our faith is personal, but it should never be private. This faith that we have as a gift from God is not meant to be buried in the deepest corners of our hearts. 
This fire of the Holy Spirit is not meant to be left flickering dimly beneath a dozen layers of self-consciousness and insecurity and personal preference and fear of embarrassment. Look, we were saved so that we could sing the new song that God has placed in our heart. That's why we were saved. Not just so that we could receive salvation, but we could proclaim the greatness of the one who saved us. 1 Peter 2.9 says, you, Christian, you believers, you are a chosen race, royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Praising is our duty. It's what we were born again to do. And it's also a privilege to seize every opportunity to point people to Jesus. In fact, the Rock City value of the week that we're focusing on this week is we will not take this for granted. We will seize every moment as if it's our last. And and what would it look like if we saw corporate worship as an opportunity to praise in such a way that those walking in these doors who have yet to put their faith in Jesus, they are compelled to believe in the God that we're praising? What if we praised like that? What if I saw worship as an opportunity for me individually to help make heaven full? And we can do that with our praise, but how you praise, it actually matters. How you praise matters. Look, we'll get excited if we find $20 in our pocket we forgot about. We'll get excited if we find $5 in our pocket that we forgot about. You just walk, you be like, oh, what is this? Oh, God is good. Look what I found, babe. Did you, put, did you know this was in here? Hey, I'm blessed and highly favored. Yes. But here we are claiming to have found the treasure of all treasures. We have been saved, delivered from the power of sin, and dwelt with the Holy Spirit. We have the promise of heaven in Christ, and we stand in the midst of those glories being proclaimed, and we look. We we look. We look bored. We look indifferent, unmoved. Some of us look miserable. We look miserable. Now, not everyone's expression of joy will look the same. Some people are just naturally more expressive than others, and that's cool. That's okay. Some people's joy looks like running and jumping and clapping. Some people's joy looks like hands lifted or smiling and singing along with the song. But listen, nobody's joy looks like this. Not now. One person who's ever been born or ever will be born, joy looks like this. Look, look, I, I can see you. Look, when I'm on the stage, we're on the stage, we're looking at you, you're looking at us, the lights are bright, they ain't that bright, okay? I see y'all. I see y'all. But our worship can lead to faith in the heart of the unbeliever, but not if they don't believe that, at least we believe it. Right? Is our claim that the best thing that anyone could ever do is give their life to Christ, is it believable based on how we tell it? Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. <laughs> You should try Jesus too. I mean, if you want, whatever. It's it's confusing. It's confusing. Right, singing together can cause faith to rise up in the heart of the unbeliever. But it can also prop up the faith of the weary believer. It can prop up the faith of the weary believer. And sometimes we all get a little bit weary. Ephesians 5, 18 to 19 says, do not get drunk with wine for that is debauchery, but be filled with the spirit addressing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making, mu- and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Now, usually when we think about worship, we're thinking in purely vertical terms, but there's also an often forgot about horizontal component to worship. We worship to God, but so often it's for the benefit of one another. Listen, there may be someone in this room right now who has just gone through the most difficult experience they will ever go through in their lives. And maybe they've been locked up in their house for two weeks because they can't find the strength to leave. And maybe today was the day that they found just enough strength to get out of bed and take a shower and put on real clothes for the first time in two weeks. And maybe today was the first day that they had just enough courage to get in their car and drive to the church parking lot and sit in the parking lot for 10 minutes while they get their game face on that they think is necessary to walk through a sea of people without being exposed for the broken and vulnerable person that they are. And maybe this person walked down the aisle and sat in the seat directly behind you and we're 
singing and we're worshiping and they can't even open their mouth because they're afraid if they make a sound, they'll break down and sob and weep and not be able to hold it together. And it may just be that the only thing holding them together is the faith of this body, boldly proclaiming the greatness and the glory and the goodness of God. Your faith, your faith, your joy may be exactly what God wants to use to hold together the pieces of their broken faith and to begin the process of restoring their hope. And if that's you, if, if you're in this room and, and, and you're the one who's just gone through something horrible, a divorce or, or a devastating diagnosis, or you just lost someone that you love and you're not sure how you're going to hold on, I see you. I see you. And God sees you. Church, do you see them? You might not know their stories, but do you see them? Look, God delights in our praise, but he doesn't need to hear it. But they might. They might. He might. She might. We sing together so that the visible, audible faith of the many can prop up the weary faith of the few. Because when we worship together, we share in a profound sense that we are not alone. I'm not alone in this walk, in this journey, in this pain, in this joy. And I have millions of brothers and sisters around the globe, but I also have people in this very room who are on the journey with me. And sometimes I just need to be reminded of the fact that not only are we all in the same room, but we're in the same boat. We're one in Christ and singing together is such a powerful reminder of that. Look, in heaven, there will be no more making heaven full. No more evangelism. No more missions, no more comforting the brokenhearted. All the work will be done. What there will be is the people of God and the presence of God. And if we want to experience a taste of heaven on earth, it could be argued that there's no better way than to worship God together. Our last point is we worship together to experience the presence of God. Experience the presence of God. God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times, and he always has been. Yet in the Old Testament, we see that there was a temple built to God. And in that temple, it was said that God dwelt. He was everywhere, but he dwelled specially, differently, uniquely in the temple. Fast forward to the New Testament, the time that we're all living in today. And there are two things referred to as the temple of God. The first is our bodies. If we've given our lives to Christ and have been saved, the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and we take him with us wherever we go. So if you're watching from a prison cell or you're for some reason can't get to a local gathering and you've given your life to Christ, the Spirit of God is with you. But there's also another thing that we see in the New Testament referred to as the temple of God. And we see it in Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. It says, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. That's the word of God. The apostles and the prophets wrote the word of God. That's our foundation. And Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. The church the, the, the unit of individuals, the group, the gathering is the temple of God. Because God is everywhere, but he dwells specially, uniquely, powerfully in this place. And there's so much of God's uh, presence to experience if we were to worship and engage and posture ourselves to experience his presence when we worship together. Now look, if this is your first time or, or you've been here for 10 years, Whoever you are, everyone in the room, I want us to do this together. I, I want us to apply this message to our own lives, our own hearts, our own worship. And ask yourself the question, honestly, what kind of worshiper am I? Now, now we're all imperfect worshipers, but, but, but what kind of worshiper am I? Maybe you're an emotionalist. Check that box in your head. You know what, I'm, I'm an emotionalist, I think. I've allowed my feelings to dictate whether or not I'll praise. I've been holding back. Maybe you're an emotionalist because you've made your feelings the goal. You have no anchor in the word of God. You feel great on Sundays, but on Monday you're empty again and you have nothing to sustain you from Sunday to Sunday. Maybe you're an emotionalist. Check that box in your mind. And, and, and if you check that box, I, I want you to know that there is grace enough for you. 
We're all imperfect worshipers, but we're not saved by the perfection of our worship. We're saved by the perfect person of Jesus that we trust. Maybe some of you realize, you know what, I'm an emotionless worshiper. I'm an emotionless worshiper. Check that box in your mind. I I don't feel anything in response to the word of God. I feel nothing in the presence of God. I feel nothing in response to worship. And what's more, you know, I'm, I'm content in my indifference. I'm satisfied not feeling anything at all in response to God. Check the box, emotionless. And if that's you, I need you to hear me today. There is grace enough for you. There is more life, more joy in your walk with Jesus. Look, we're not saved by the perfection of our worship. We're saved by the perfect person of Jesus that we trust and worship. And there's some of you here today and you look at your heart and you look at your life and you realize, you know what, I'm not a worshiper of God at all. I I don't think I've ever worshiped God. Check that box in your mind. I'm not a worshiper of God at all, if I'm being honest. I've never lived as if God was the most valuable thing. I've built my life around so many other things and chased so many other things other than God to feel satisfied. And maybe it's even something good. Maybe you've built your life on family or career or health, or maybe it's something like drugs and addiction. Whatever it is, you realize that that it, it never seems to satisfy and fulfill you like you hoped it would. And there's a reason for that. Because there's only one person that fits the seat on the throne of your heart. There's only one person that can fully satisfy, one person worthy of your worship, and his name is Jesus. And if that's you and you realize that you've never worshiped God, if that's you, I need you to hear me today. There is grace enough for you. There is grace for you. Whether you're at rock bottom or not, there is grace enough for you. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Neither the sexually immoral nor idolaters, those who value things other than over and above their creator, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, greedy, drunkards, slanderers, swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, that is what some of you were. See, Paul is writing to believers, and he says that's what some of you were. You were idolaters. You were drunkards. You were liars. You were slanderers. But you were washed. You were sanctified and set apart. You were justified, declared innocent in the sight of God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Look, the bad news is that the wages of sin is death, and that's what we all deserve. But the good news is that the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. If you but call upon his name. And if that's you, if you want to be washed of your sin, you want to be changed, saved, if you want to give your life to Jesus, I want to lead you in a prayer. But I want you to understand that this prayer itself is not what saves you. There's no magic formula. And if you say all these words in the correct order, then you're magically saved. Like you're saved by grace through your faith in Jesus, putting your trust in God. And that happens in the heart. But if we've learned anything today, it's that a faith that is produced should be professed. So I want to help you express what's happening in your heart. If every head would bow and every eye would close, if you want to give your life to Jesus, you can pray along with me word for word or just put it in your own words. But say, God, I confess my sin before you, that I have made things other than you the center of my life and heart. I have run to so many other things, and today... I am done running. Right now, I'm turning from my sin. I am done trying to live apart from you, and I'm calling on the name of Jesus to be saved. Forgive me. Save my soul. Change my heart and my life. God, restore my worship back to you. Amen. And if you would just keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed for a minute. I also want to pray over those who check the first two boxes. Pray over the church, the emotionalist or the emotionless or, or whatever situation we're in and our, and our worship is not what it could or should be. So Heavenly Father, I just pray that your spirit move in the hearts of your people, Lord God. I pray that you would give us a desire to anchor our hearts in the word and the truth of your Bible, Lord God. I pray that you would give us hearts that are renewed and restored, that you would restore to us the joy of your salvation, Lord God. I pray that our worship would no longer be inconsistent, determined by whether or not we feel like singing, God, but that we would worship you at all times and in every way and with all that we are, Lord God. Awaken our worship. Stir our hearts. God, we want to give you all that we are. 
God, we want all that you have for us in the name of Jesus. Awaken our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.